Hello, everybody. This is Mr. Lassie, and I am here to talk to you a little bit more about the value of a liberal arts and science education. Before we get started, I do want to be able to talk to you a little bit about my college search. So when I was a junior in high school, I remember being called into my high school counseling office and my college counselor asked me what I was thinking about studying and what I really wanted in my college experience. And I said I wanted to play soccer because I was still wanting to pursue uh, playing professionally and uh, studying psychology. And so he responded right away and said, have you thought about Ohio Wesleyan University? And I had no thoughts of leaving California at that point. I am from a very small Northern California town, about 5,000 people and small high school up in the mountains, redwood trees. And when I thought of Ohio, I thought of that as almost being a foreign country. And I just wasn't comfortable with leaving Northern California. So I said, really, no thanks. And I started doing my own college search. And I knew that the UCs were really strong. They had a great reputation. And I knew I wanted to stay in Northern California. And so that really left two options for me uh, in terms of you know, strong schools and Northern California. And that was UC Davis and UC Berkeley. And so I knew I was gonna go to either one of those schools. And at the same time, I really didn't know much about them. So when I did do my college search and went and visited UC Davis, the first thing I noticed was that it was very, very flat and there were cows everywhere. And again, because I'm from a small town up in the mountains with redwood trees, this was very different, very foreign to me. I didn't feel all that comfortable. It just wasn't, I didn't fall in love right away. It wasn't something that excited me. And then I went to UC Berkeley and walking around that campus and even getting to that campus, the first thing I recognized was I'm in the city. There's tall skyscrapers everywhere, uh, cars everywhere, honking, lots of people, very chaotic, very busy. And so I wasn't feeling all that comfortable at Berkeley. I also remember going into a lecture room where during this college tour where we went into the lecture room and there's 300 students in the lecture and that was overwhelming. And then we went next door and there was another lecture hall of 300 students. And instead of the professor being in the front of the room, there was actually a screen of the lecture going on next door. So that was a class size of about 500, 600 students, which was, you know, absolutely not something I was looking forward to. So with those two off the list, I then started searching again. And, you know, we were still doing this college tour. And I remember going onto the UC Santa Cruz campus and falling in love. It's up in the mountains. It overlooks Monterey Bay. So it's absolutely picturesque, very beautiful. Uh, one of the most beautiful campuses in the US, uh, according to all these other you know, rankings that are out there. And I, of course, I didn't know that at the time. For me though, it was the, the feeling that I got on that campus. It is a large research institution, University of California system, all schools are like that. And at the same time, UC Santa Cruz was broken up into 10 smaller colleges. So I had that small community feel within a larger research institution. And so I knew, yes, UC Santa Cruz, this is a school for me. I applied, I was lucky to get in and maybe not lucky, I, I had strong scores. So, you know, I was happy to be able to get in and that was it. And I was on campus all four years. I lived on campus. I was a resident advisor for two years, uh, which means I got free room and board. So they gave me free food and uh, a free room in the dorms as kind of like payment for being a resident advisor. So I was looking after the night, the new students coming in, the freshmen. So I loved it. It was fantastic. It was an incredible experience. I learned, you know, obviously about psychology and I minored in education. And at the same time, I still had large class sizes. I had about 150, 200 students, even my third and fourth year in my psych program. 
And that's because psychology is very popular. Had I taken a lesser, you know, known major, maybe underwater basket weaving, maybe I would have had less students or I would have definitely had less students if I had done, uh, gone in a different path. For psychology though, a lot of students, I didn't know my professors, my professors didn't know me. Office hours were really challenging, really difficult because so many students wanted to go and meet with the professor. So I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't learning nearly as much as I could have had I been in a smaller seminar Socratic style classroom. And that's what I did have my, my last year there. That was my favorite course, Psych of Flim Flam, which is, you know, I, I still remember all sorts of different, um, you know, feelings and history and knowledge uh, about just flim flam, which is essentially, you know, why do we believe in, in certain things and, you know, perception of say, um, for example, astrology or uh, horoscopes, why do we believe in those and, you know, Barnum statements. Anyway, it's something where had I gone back and, you know, done this again, knowing what I know today, I would have never gone to UC Santa Cruz. And the reason being is that I would have preferred smaller class sizes. I, I remember one uh, microeconomics course that I went twice at UC Santa Cruz. And it was the first class and the last class. And I was able, I was able to get an A in the class just simply by doing uh, online quizzes and reading lecture notes. And I, I just wasn't being held accountable. My professor had no idea whether or not I was in the room or if I was back in my dorm room playing Mario Kart. So it's something for me where if, if we're paying all this money for an education and I can be able to do that from my dorm room and, and of course not during a global pandemic, so I could have been in the classroom. It's just not, it, it's not for me. Like I learn best from discussions. I learn best from working with people and that experience in large class sizes, I wasn't getting that. So if I could go back and do it again, I would go to a small private liberal arts and science college. There's 11 in, the, in California, so I could have you know, picked one of those. I know a lot of them do tend to be in Southern California, not Northern California. And at the same time, I would hope that I would be a little bit more open-minded to you know, possibly you know, going to Ohio Wesleyan or going on the East Coast and getting outside of my bubble of Northern California. If, Somebody told me back then in high school that I would be a school counselor in Manila, Philippines. I would have never you know, thought that that would be possible. So obviously you're gonna go down the path that you think is gonna be best for you. And then going from there, um, I just want you to be able to have more of an open mind than I did when I was in high school. Here are some myths about small liberal arts colleges. So a lot of times when uh, people think of the liberal arts, they think it's just or the arts or humanities, the social sciences. And part of this presentation, I'll tell you, you know, a little bit more about how you can be able to study, say, engineering uh, while in, in liberal arts or have that be part of your pathway. So if you have that dream of wanting to be an engineer, you're like, oh, I can't go to a liberal arts and science college then you know, hopefully after this presentation, you'll be a little bit more open-minded to that. Uh, same thing about you know, the idea of how employers and getting a job, it's all about that brand name or big name university to be able to get that job. And that's simply you know, not the case. And if anything, it's, it's just the opposite in some respects um, for those smaller colleges. And then the thought of, well, more students and being in a big city, there's going to be more opportunity for internships and research at those larger institutions. And that certainly was not my experience at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, for me, it was uh, even harder and more difficult to get internships because there were so many students trying to get those same internships. And certainly research, there's no way that I was able to do research alongside professors as an undergraduate student at the UC campus. Uh, that would have been the same thing had I gone to Davis or Berkeley or UCLA. There, the professors are there for the graduate level and for their research. And so those graduate students are doing the research with the professors. The undergraduates, in my case, I remember being paid $25 or $50 to be a participant 
in this uh, in research, not being able to actually conduct the research. So if you're looking for research opportunities, internships, maybe a smaller liberal arts college is more your cup of tea. A quick history lesson as well, just in terms of how did liberal arts really come to be. Uh, breaking it down, uh, liberalis means worthy of a free person. And so liberal arts, uh, certainly you know what arts are as well. A liberal arts education was a course of study considered really essential for free citizens of ancient Greece and Rome. And it was really to satisfy their desire for universal understanding. You can see that the, the first seven disciplines, uh, mathematics, geometry, music, astronomy, logic, rhetoric or speech, and grammar. So that, those were the original seven. And today we really lump those together and we consider three main areas, the social sciences, arts, and humanities. And like I said, there's a way to be able to get science in there as well. The value of a liberal arts education, that's what really this presentation is all about. It's really teaching these skills. So again, thinking about employers, what are they looking for in, in, in someone who they wanna bring in into their company or into a school, for example. They want people that can be able to think on their feet, that can problem solve, that can work on teams. Certainly the presentation skills, communication skills are, are vital for that working on teams as well. And more of a cultural awareness and understanding. So some smaller liberal arts schools will have that requirement that you gotta have a language or you gotta study abroad or you have to do community service or an internship. Whereas large research institutions, they simply don't do that. Uh, I didn't have to learn a language. Uh, I didn't have to take math classes because I passed out of math. My math in high school was good enough. So it's something where, you know, if you want to be able to have a um, more in-depth sort of curriculum and program, then a liberal arts education might be it. And, and same thing for breadth. I think that's a good segue um, to a next slide coming up as well. So these are some benefits. So obviously the smaller the school, the smaller the class sizes, the lower student to faculty ratio, which means you have more access to faculty. So it's very common at a private liberal arts and science college that a student might be uh, sitting down in the dining hall and eating across from their professor or uh, even some cases living in the same building or the same house as a professor or a faculty member, traveling, going on service trips with that faculty member. So it's really getting to know and working alongside these experts in their field. And those professors are there at that small liberal arts and science college because they want to work with undergraduate students. They could have the opportunity to go to larger research institutions in that case, they would be working alongside graduate level. So that access to faculty is, is much um, better at those smaller schools, obviously more focus on the undergraduate student. And with eating together, traveling together, some cases playing sports together, there's this emphasis on community. And that goes beyond the college that usually goes into the neighboring town or small city. Uh, in some cases, larger cities or some of these small private liberal arts and science colleges. And big universities catch on to this. They do value the liberal arts as well. It's not that they simply say, no, we're going to do all research, 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 have large class sizes. They have created, in many cases, a college of liberal arts, a college of arts and science, liberal studies. Right? So these are some of the different universities, and it's not just the US. So Exeter in the UK, Seoul National University in Korea, and here in the Philippines, De La Salle has a College of Liberal Arts. So this is something that as you're doing that research, you can be able to take a look. The one caution I would, I would say is even though you might be you know, attending this college within this larger university, what are the class sizes like? Right? Are there still going to be classes that are 200, 250 students? Or are these classes going to be more like the private liberal arts and science colleges of about 20, 25 students? 
So that'd be a really important question to be able to ask. Who has access to classes within the College of Arts and Science at UNC, right? Or College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Arizona State? So that's gonna be something in terms of the class sizes, because that's gonna to indicate to you whether or not you will have that same access to the faculty member. In terms of the curriculum, yes, it is, it does provide a lot of flexibility, a lot of freedom for students to be able to pick and choose what they wanna study. In many cases, it's gonna have a core curriculum where all students will be taking the same courses in the first year. And then afterwards, they'll start um, getting more into their major or their minor, maybe double majors or um, different minors cross-registration with different universities. Barnard is a great example of that, of students being able to take classes at Barnard as well as Columbia. So that's something to be able to look at. Um, and I'll show you another program for engineering as well. So it's something where, again, you don't, don't think of liberal arts as you go there and you just learn the humanities, you just learn arts. This so many different um, ways that you can be able to get a liberal arts background and still major in say, you know, biology. That's certainly doable. I mentioned before in terms of that depth and breadth that the liberal arts curriculum has. So an example of real depth for another university is say the UK. The UK is specifically more of a course driven pre-professional kind of program. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna study maths at Imperial or LSE for economics, right? And so it's gonna go into you know depth in that one area. They're just not gonna be learning other sides of it. So, and the other side of it is breadth. Like say, for example, I had to take all these general education requirements at Santa Cruz. And so it was learning all these different subjects in different ways and just not going as deep into it. So a liberal arts curriculum is gonna be able to do both. They're gonna allow you to be able to go deep within your major as well as a breadth, knowing all these different areas that they expect, going back to being that really good global citizen, if you will. This is one example of a core curriculum. So this is at Elon College the College of Arts and Science at Elam University in North Carolina. You'll notice that all students really take that first year foundations program that does allow students to be able to have that common sort of language and connection with each other that first year. So living together in the dorms or the apartments, online classes, they're having those same sort of conversations centered around those core subjects that all students are taking. Then getting into more of that world languages, studies in the arts and sciences, all students will have to take certain courses in those areas. They're also doing needing to do undergraduate research, service learning, a global engagement, sometimes even having to do a um, go abroad, which, geez, okay, I have to go abroad? Done, let's do it. Sometimes international students don't have to do that since they already are coming in with that global mindset. And at the same time, maybe you do wanna do that again. And then getting into some leadership with some co-curricular activities on campus and internships outside of the campus uh, with the neighboring town or cities. And then getting into more of the advanced studies and getting into the majors and maybe double majors there. And it all ends with that capstone seminar. And that's something that you're gonna see whenever you look at liberal arts and science colleges, a lot of times they'll talk about that capstone, um, that culminating project when you're a senior. Yale and US, this is going to be another example that I can show you in terms of their curriculum. So four years, eight semesters, one interdisciplinary curriculum. So Yale, obviously, uh, Ivy League school, East Coast in the US, and the US, a research institution in Singapore coming together, creating their own interdisciplinary curriculum. It took them years to be able to do this. Very, very cool, amazing opportunity. So this is what four years looks like at Yale and US. That first year, this is what everyone's taking in blue. That's a common curriculum that again, it's gonna center conversations around these courses, really going into in depth. These conversations will take place in uh, the dorm rooms, the apartments, the dining halls, in classes, small class sizes. I remember visiting Yale and US a, a few years ago and I was in a class size of about 
nine students and one student was late to class and the professor was able to call that student and say, where are you? You're late. That's incredible. That sort of access to professors where, you know, they have the phone number of the professor. The professor has that student's phone number and they can like follow up. They know exactly whether or not you're there or not. And during that Socratic style, you know, class, it was talking, it was discussing, it wasn't all lecture based, which was fantastic. Students learned a lot more. I learned a lot more. So that's something that I, you know, walked away really strong feeling for that school. Year two, getting into more elective courses, that's going to be more of possibly going down that major route or a minor route. There's still a couple core curriculum courses that students take. And then year three is when students are getting into their actual major. So, uh, you know, and then year four, obviously, a lot more into the major, their capstone project, you see that in the first and second semester, and they're graduating. So that gives you an idea and you'll be able to see this for all the different universities that you're doing research in. What does that look like to be a student there? What curriculum? I mentioned the engineering program. So this is for Columbia. Uh, Dartmouth has a similar sort of program and uh, other large research institutions will have uh, similar sort of programs as well. So look for three, two programs. Uh, for this one, it would be three years at an affiliated liberal arts and science college and then a student would be able to get that bachelor's degree, Bachelor of Arts from that college. And then two years to get a Bachelor of Science in an engineering discipline from Columbia University. This isn't a guaranteed entry. This is something that students would have to apply for. They would have to take specific courses and do well in those specific courses, hit a certain GPA to be able to then be eligible to be able to get into this program. They also need three recommendation letters, uh, one from a faculty uh, in math and then science and then the plan liaison at that college. That recommendation, again, going back to my experience at UC Santa Cruz, it would have been very difficult for me to be able to ask for recommendation letters from my professors. I would have had to go to office hours all the time, wait in line, really get to know those professors and make that a habit for them to really know who I was. That's difficult. Going to a small school where access with faculty members uh, is a lot easier. And again, living with them, traveling with them, eating with them, playing sports with them, that's going to be a lot easier to be able to get that recommendation letter from that professor, doing research with them. So that'll help you get into some of these programs. And that's same for graduate school as well, or getting a job. So 4% of all undergraduate students attend liberal arts colleges. That's a very, very small fraction of the um, undergraduate population. And this is within the US. Even though they represent a small fraction, they do re represent a larger fraction of these different areas. So twice the amount in terms of Fortune 500 CEOs. And then seven times the amount for US presidents. 27%, a quarter of US presidents went to those small private liberal arts and science colleges. And then 14%, so about three times, four times for Harvard law professors. And you'll also notice that bottom graphic in the sense of how many you know, students or how many schools represent the highest uh, per capita basis for graduates going to their PhDs. And they're coming from those liberal arts and science colleges. So that's it's very, very cool, including five of the top 10 in the field of science and math. So again, it goes against that grain of, you know, well, you're going for, you know, humanities or the arts at liberal arts science college. Well, no, I could be going for science or math. So those STEM fields are important. Speaking of STEM fields, graduation rates. So, you know, how many of them are being able to graduate in time? So the students that uh, do graduate the finish in four years, 80% smaller private colleges versus 52% at larger public research institutions versus 34% at regional public universities. So that gives you a sense that, you know, the smaller private colleges, students are doing better, they're sticking with it, their retention rate is higher, uh, and they're able to finish on time more often than not. 
Same sort of thing for PhD programs in STEM. So 20% of PhDs in STEM fields graduated from smaller private colleges. That's incredible. That's a fifth, right? Even though they represent 4%, a fifth of them, of the PhDs are coming from those smaller private colleges. And then going back to the employers. So 80% of employers think think students should acquire broad knowledge in the liberal arts. And there's all sorts of different quotes out there that you can see. Um, Steve Jobs has one, all these you know, big CEOs and, and people. Even though I, I don't think Steve Jobs graduated from university, he did go to a private liberal arts and science college and then continued taking courses online and uh, distance learning. So these are some famous liberal arts college alumni Hopefully you do recognize some of these names. So there's presidents on there. There are uh, entrepreneurs. There's certainly politicians, coaches, journalists, psychologists, authors, actors, singers, actors. So all sorts of famous people. What do they do and where do they go to college? So all sorts of big uh, names that come up in the liberal arts and science college ranking lists. Speaking of rankings, so again, going back to graduation rates, 24 of the top 50 in terms of highest four-year graduation rates are liberal arts and science colleges. And these are some of them. So these are just nine of those 24, 92% except or uh, graduation rate. That's fantastic all of these 89, 88%, and you saw that on average is about 80%, which again is very, very, very solid. America's top colleges for 2019, this is according to Forbes, 17 of the top 50 are liberal arts, including these eight. And you're gonna see a very similar list with the best colleges of 2019, top 50, 16 of the top 50 liberal arts. Again, there's a lot more than just these eight. There's another eight as well that show up in that top 50. A lot of these schools in this list and the previous list, yes, they're highly selective. They're challenging to be able to get into, uh, similar to those highly selective uh, private research institutions as well. These are some resources that you can be able to take a look at. So the Hidden Ivies, if you know we do want that background that you know highly selective uh, institution uh, from a private liberal arts and science college take a look at the hidden ivies you can see that list of 63 different schools and then colleges that change lives every counselor in this office uh, at ism will have a copy of this you can certainly borrow it it, it is eye-opening it does tell stories about students that do attend these specific colleges 40 of them and it's, it's trying to get you to realize that somebody can go there and really open up their eyes to the world, open up their eyes about education. They might be coming in uh, having had prior learning difficulties in high school, and then they go to this college and the light bulb goes off and they fall in love with just learning overall. So it's, it's something where, you know, Again, being a little bit more open-minded and maybe that's why you're here. Maybe you've already been sold and you're like, yes, I wanna go to a liberal arts and science college. Which one should I go to, right? So that, that could be something that you do a little bit more research with that, either looking at either one of these books. We talked a lot about the US. So are there other liberal arts and science colleges elsewhere in the world? Absolutely. You can definitely take a look at a lot of these examples out there. I'm going to show you all sorts of different options, and it's certainly not an exhaustive list. So one example we've already mentioned in Singapore with Yale and US College. Again, phenomenal. It is very challenging to be able to get in. Uh, I think it's maybe their fifth year or so that they've been open and you know that's certainly something you can check out. It is very, very diverse as well, which is great. Yonsei University, so the Underwood International College, that's in Korea. So this is very popular for our students and not just our Korean students, our, our students from elsewhere uh, do look at this campus as well. Very international feeling. 
Lingnan University, same thing. So this is in Hong Kong, in the mountains there. How gorgeous and beautiful would that be to attend school there? Again, it's a little bit more international, English-based. And then getting into Canada, so Bishop's University. I believe that's near Montreal. And then actually, Canada has created the Maple League of Universities, or at least these four colleges that I'll show you have created this Maple League. Similar to the Ivy League, that they do see themselves as uh, pioneers in some ways. And these are very old colleges as well, so they have a, a very rich history and they're coming together to show an extraordinary way of learning. So those four are St. Francis Xavier in Nova Scotia. You'll notice that uh, these campuses are, they have older buildings. It's very green. There is a football field for each of them as well. So they do have sports programs. There's track and field as well. So all sorts of different sports opportunities and in a smaller private liberal arts and science college. Acadia University, same sort of thing. You can see the nice, it looks like a river in the background. The brick buildings that if you're wanting that um, kind of older historic kind of feel to it, uh, the East Coast has that a lot in the US as well. So does Canada. So these are all on the east, eastern side of Canada. Mount Allison, same sort of thing. And then St. Thomas University. St. Thomas is a little bit closer to a bigger city. So that's kind of nice as well if you're wanting to be closer to the city and not so far away from, um, I guess, what we consider to be the world, right? Oftentimes students think of being in a rural community, a small college town as being you know, intimidating or scary. So you can look at, and there are in the US as well, some private liberal arts and science colleges in big cities. And then getting into the Netherlands, if you don't know about the university college system in the Netherlands, Leiden is a great example. So this is actually in The Hague. So all of these larger research institutions, University of Leiden, it will have an honors college. So the honors college is a university college, The Hague. So a lot of uh, diplomacy, politics, international relations, uh, they're really, really strong in that. University College Utrecht, so uh, it's obviously of the larger University of Utrecht. So this is their honors college. It is much more international. Both of these programs are taught in English uh, and very diverse, smaller, about 3,000 students uh, at the most. So that's something where, you know, it's, it's a similar sort of experience that you would probably get at ISM, these smaller private liberal arts and science colleges. Beautiful campus. Everybody was riding their bikes when I went and visited Utrecht in this campus. Uh, everything was walking distance. It was wonderful. Canals everywhere. Very cool. Amsterdam University, uh, American University of Paris, sorry. So how cool would it be to be able to have this sort of education living in Paris? That'd be amazing. It is near the Eiffel Tower, which is very, very cool. So that could be an option for you. And there's American universities in all these different, you know, big cities around the world um, that you can be able to look up. Jakobs University in Bremen, Germany. So that could be an option. Very cool. It has that center sort of area. The grass in there. Very green. Very cool. John Cabot University in Rome. So that could be an option. Again, this is more of like an American sort of curriculum, a liberal arts and science college in Rome. Franklin University in Switzerland, same sort of thing. Gorgeous up in um, the Alps in Switzerland. McDaniel College in Budapest. Hungary, that'd be beautiful and amazing and awesome. Big city, liberal arts education. Bard College. So again, another American small private liberal arts and science college setting up shop in Berlin and also working together in St. Petersburg. So Smolny has this as well. So the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Science College there in St. Petersburg, Russia. And then last but not least, NYU Abu Dhabi. So this is very popular for some of our students at ISM. Again, very diverse. I lived in Dubai for six years. The weather is 
pretty similar, although very dusty at times. So that's something that you could be able to look forward to and, and having similar sort of weather as here. I would say it's probably more humid there than here. But very, and you know, this could be financially very beneficial as well because the Emirati Abu Dhabi government helps pay for tuition for students there. And then the last thing I'm going to leave you with is if you don't believe anything that I just said, maybe listen to somebody who's even more brilliant. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm brilliant. <laughs> so Albert Einstein, I'm sure you know, uh, he said the value of an education in a liberal arts college is not the learning of many facts, but the training of the mind to think something that cannot be learned from textbooks how right he was. Thank you, Albert, for that. So if you have any other questions that come up about the liberal arts and science colleges, please reach out to your counselor. You can fill out a question on the form that we sent out in the very beginning of the presentation this evening, uh, or you can be able to just simply reach out to your, your child's counselor or your counselor if you're a student. So we'd love to hear about this. Uh, we love pushing liberal arts and science colleges because we definitely buy in. We love it. As I said, I would have loved to go there. I would have loved to know more about it when I was in high school. So think about it. And I know that it's not for everybody. I know that people are looking for different options as well. They want that big rah, rah, rah Friday football game match that you might not be able to get at these smaller private liberal arts and science colleges. Um, so it, it all comes down to your priorities. What are you looking for? I would look at the di diversity of these schools as well, the international population of these schools. Sometimes they're not as strong. Um, they tend to be more white for some parts and less international. So that might not be your cup of tea either. So it all comes down to your priority. What are you looking for? What are you wanting in your education? And for me, if I was your parent, I'm certainly your counselor for many of you, I would want you to get the best education possible. And so that's where, where is that going to be? All right. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Bye.